based on the lowest responsible bidder. We cannot be giving out work simply because it's convenient or because a politician wants us to, or even because we like the contractor. Now, most change orders are changes in quantities to existing items, but there may be times that you'll need to add new items to a contract, or you may need to extend the contract completion date through a time extension. Time extension is just a very specific type of a change order. So I have a couple of bullet points that I want to go over. Uh, number one on my list, all change orders need to be approved by the Office of the State Control, OSC. Do not lie to OSC. Be truthful in everything that is written in Site Manager on this change order. Number two, explain why the change order is necessary. Is all the work within scope? Was there a design change? If so, is concurrence from the designer of record attached? The explanations in Site Manager need to address what work is entailed in the change order and why does this work need to be added. These two things actually often get overlooked in the explanations. And they're very important because you've got to remember that the people reviewing these are not intimately familiar with the project the way you are. In fact, a lot of the people that are reviewing these, um, these change orders are, are not engineers. They're either accountants or uh, people down at OSC. So again, what work is entailed in the OSC and, or in the change order and why does it need to be added? Um, out of scope changes, outliers and unusual cases, always ask first. Um, for new items or items that exceed the thresholds in section 10902, how did we come to agreement on a price for each item? Is the required backup attached? Keep in mind, only one change order is allowed in the state financial uh, system, SFS, at the time. So if you have multiple change orders and a preference of which one should be first in line, you need to let us know. For time extensions, you need to explain why more time is needed. Was the delay on the contractor or was it something out of his control? Seasonal weather variations are supposed to be anticipated by the contractor. Hurricanes and major floods should not. And my last point is the same as my first. Do not lie to OSC. Include all the information in a change order that needs so it can be properly reviewed. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mike Pimpinella. Thanks, John. Really sure. appreciate that. Um, so, I'm sorry, what did you say? Before you get started, um, I have to ask all the panelists to mute themselves. Um, and if anybody has the ability to go to edit personal preferences, they can turn off all the beeps. Um, somebody is back feeding into the recording, and that's why we're hearing it, and um, it, it's obstructing some of the sound. Gotcha. Hey, I'm and real quick, just, just before we start, I, I didn't I didn't introduce Mike Pimpinella and Eli Coe are going to be training you guys today. They're from Region 2. They've done a lot of work to put some, this week's and next week's session together and on this whole OE training overall. And the boss, you keep here telling us what to do. That's Amy Klutz here in Region 8. She's awesome. She is – she is uh, – she 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 leads us she leads her squad and she's she's the WebEx guru. He, he's the one that is uh, helping this all come together. So I just wanted to recognize those guys quick. And uh, Mike, take it away, Mike and Eli. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate that. And John, Amy. So we've we've got a this is our first kind of foray into anything of this size. Everybody, you can see. Uh, oh, I don't know. What are we? 266 attendees, which is great. Um, but to be able to be to control everything, um, you're going to be muted. You're not going to be able to talk, and we don't we, we don't get background noise. But we still will take feedback. There's a chat feature, so feel free to use the chat feature. Um, each presenter in this whole series will have uh, someone watching the chat box, and they'll jump in and and um, try to answer your question in real time. We'll also leave some time at the end uh, for question and answer. Hopefully, the formal program is only about an hour. Uh, or less, and that'll uh, 
give us time to, to have a little bit of feedback um, in this type of setting. Obviously, it's a little difficult, and uh, we're still getting the hang of, of this WebEx training uh, module, but uh, excited to see so many people on today. Um, so the question is, why are we here? Why is uh, why are we working on change orders? Well, we saw an opportunity um, to train a larger audience than normal. John mentioned we usually do an OE training, and we were thinking about how we could deliver that this year. And um, we said, well, the change orders is really good for everyone that's in construction. Um, so whatever your role is in the construction group, um, hopefully you, there's something here for you to learn. Um, we're going to start out with parts one and two are going to be fairly basic. So if you're not that familiar with change orders, some of this uh, will be new information for you. If you are familiar, if you've been um, you know, working with change orders and contract administration for some time, perhaps some of this is a review. Um, but uh, we thank you for being here. And uh, like John mentioned, this is usually part of the OE training. So uh, those that are in OE school this year, it's a virtual a light series, a lot less time, but this is part of it. So um, again, we thank everybody for being here. So let's look at what we have to um, kind of uh, look forward to over the next seven weeks. So we're going to do this once a week for seven weeks, one hour a week for seven weeks. So today we're going to talk about introduction, uh, the 100 section. We're going to talk about different types of change orders, definition of a change order. We're also going to talk about the CONR 104, which is the AEW. Week number two next week, we're going to talk about field change payments. Um, we're going to look at, you know, what we have to do to uh, produce those, and we're also going to look into Site Manager at how we would input that into Site Manager. Then we're going to, uh, and then that's myself and Eli Coe are going to work on these two modules. Then we're going to change it up a little bit, and uh, we're going to have Eric and Amy are going to be working on agreed price methods uh, for uh, extra work, and that'll be one week. And then for two weeks, we'll have force account methods. Um, and that's maybe the most scary part of change orders for everybody is force account, but we're going to spend two weeks walking through it. A lot of different things to pick up there. Um, and we should mention these are also being recorded, so we can watch these again and the PowerPoints will be available. Um, and then in week number six, we're actually going to have site manager setting up the change order. So look at how we actually take that extra work. How do we put that into site manager? Uh, appropriately reference the QRGs we'll talk about all that and then the last week will be time extensions. So that's what we have to look forward to. Um, again, these will be recorded. We should have them available to us uh, shortly. Um, so let's start out with the basics, kind of change order, funny change order 101. We have the standard section. So you'll see in uh, our presentations today and, to, and next week, uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll get a reference where there's a reference available. So this is uh, out of the standard specifications, 101-02, definition of terms. So this is what actually defines um, the, um, what actually defines what a change order is. So this is the contract definition of a change order. It is a written order issued by the department covering contingencies, extra work, deductions, increases or decreases and additions, alterations or omissions to the plans or specifications. Okay, so that's, there's a lot there, but basically, as John mentioned earlier, this is pretty much covering any change we have to a contract. Uh, second sentence is a change order is referred to as an order on contract in state highway law. So many of us have been around the DOT many years now. Um, you may have heard both of these terms, and they're kind of used interchangeably within the department, a change order or an order on contract. So they're really referring to the same thing. Um, but that's that's our definition. That's where we see uh, what a change order is, is 101.02. So who has the authority to issue change orders? Where do we get that authority? Well, the department as a whole has the authority to issue change orders. When you look at the 100 section, those of you that have had a chance to look at that or be to EIC school or be in EIC, we generally refer to the engineer as the one that has the authority, but they're acting on the department as a whole. Um, so that's kind of where we go with change orders is it's the engineer enacting uh, some change to a contract that's come from the department from multiple different ways. So these are the subsections in the 100 
Uh, we're not going to go to each one and read them, but they're there if you want to look more. But 104 would be where we would find these. So 10402, this um, covers changes, contingencies, extra work, and deductions. That's pretty straightforward. So it says, you know, if we have extra work, we are deducting work, what are the rules, what are we doing? Uh, pretty straightforward section. 10403 talks about differing site conditions. So this is where we start getting into a little bit of uh, maybe just someone's opinion or different things like that. But when you read it, it's uh, good to understand. It gives a, uh, an example of like underground conditions. So maybe we're, we're building a foundation for a structure or something like that, and we run into rock, and that wasn't presented in the plans. So that would be a case of a differing site condition from what's presented in the plans. Or, you know, maybe we've been on a bridge and we're driving piles and there's an estimated pile length. Maybe it was 35 feet and we get out there and we're driving piles to 70 feet. That's a differing site condition, right? So um, we have that clause in the contract as a way uh, to issue a contract change order. 10404, significant changes in the character of work. So uh, what we commonly would refer to this section for was would be uh, major or minor items that break thresholds. Um, is, a, is considered a significant change, and we're going to define that later on, what are major and minor items. Um, but there are kind of ceilings and floors in major item case where if we double an item or more than double an item, it, it triggers a significant change uh, automatically that we have to review. Uh, there could be other things, you know, maybe we had something of a, of a very large quantity and we eliminate most of it, it may change the character of its work. So we would have the authority to issue a change order in that case. 10405 talks about suspensions of work. And these are generally suspensions by the department through the engineer. So the engineer would suspend work. Sometimes we have this, uh, maybe utilities haven't got out of the way and there's really uh, no work for the contractor to do. That's kind of a de facto suspension of work. It, we may not order the suspension, but it, it may just be that way. Um, other times, maybe we've uncovered something or uh, we get in a spot where uh, there's some type of redesign going on or something like that and it's not quite ready and we order the contractor to stop work until we can uh, provide clear direction. Um, this has also come into play. Um, maybe there's some kind of large traffic event and we need to order the, the contractor off the road for a couple of days to accommodate an event. This clause may come into play. Uh, additionally, 104-10 is value engineer change proposals, VECP. The value engineer proposal itself is not a change order until it's approved by main office, and then we would um, add it to the contract by a change order. And then 10802, this is our authority to extend a completion date or uh, grant a contractor request to extend the completion date. So these are the references where we find where we have the authority to issue a change order. And just remember, everybody, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat box. Uh, but when is a change order needed? So this kind of gets into the practical application of what we just talked about. Uh, the first one, probably is the most likely that you're going to see is payment for item overruns and underruns. Um, any of us that have been on a couple of projects by now, we know that you very rarely hit every item in the contract right at the contract quantity. We're either up or down, even if it's minor, uh, right? We might have uh, 100 feet of curb and we put in 105 feet. Uh, we might have uh, 5,000 feet of striping and we put in 5,025, right? We go just over. Well, there's going to have to be a payment adjustment for that. Um, extra work. So we get to a point and, you know, design forgot to add this or a homeowner or a politician is kind of really wants the sidewalk extended 20 feet, 30 feet, whatever, and, and we get an approval to do that. That's extra work. A time extension. A uh, contractor wasn't able to complete in time. They've requested an extension. There's going to be a change order involved. Field change sheets. If uh, the design group, you know, maybe they've they noticed something or something, we give them feedback and uh, we need to have a field change sheet issued. Those have to be added by change order to the contract. Funding adjustment. Um, now, these are usually more complicated projects where you have multiple uh, fiscal shares, and they're not always DOT fiscal shares. They could be local municipality, utility company, uh, railroad, uh, 
some other entity, throughway canal, uh, you know, whatever the case, um, is there an adjustment with that? Are we adding a new chair? Maybe someone else that wasn't involved in the design now is in, uh, at the design phase and letting phase is now involved and needs to put up some money uh, to accomplish, you know, a task or something like that. Additionally, you may find this in an emergency situation. So if we have a widespread emergency, uh, we may be directed for funding purposes to add a new share to a contract, an emergency or a standby or a where and when, uh, so that we can accurately uh, keep track of work that's going on within that, that specific event, especially if it's a large event that may be declared and be FEMA eligible. The addition of warranty specifications I know in our region this year we had uh, seems like more warranty paving than we've had the last couple years combined. Adding that specification for warranty paving is an addition to the contract. That's a change order. We talked about VECPs and also dispute resolution. So uh, we try our best to work things out with the contractor in the field, um, but there's a dispute. It gets elevated, and whatever the resolution of that is um, would be added to a contract by change order. So basically, in summary, whenever a contract item or term is changed, we're going to need a change order. Okay, that's that's pretty much the summary of that. So let's just take a minute and and yeah, we might blow up the chat box here, but let's you know we might remember that show MythBusters. You now they they would start with a premise and prove it true or false. Let's just do that a little bit with change orders because uh, most of you are here because you know something about change orders. You know it's important, you know it's complicated, you may not know enough about it, you know you need more knowledge, whatever the case. So we all know something about change orders. Um, so let's see how much we know and and go from there. It's a little game. So feel free in the chat box to type true or false. Let's do the first one. All change orders include complicated force account packages and lots of paperwork. Common myth, I've heard it myself when I was, uh, before I was an engineer, before I was an office engineer. Every change order is complicated, lots of paperwork. Any any guesses? Go ahead and type it in the chat box. True or false? Okay, so we're getting some now. Probably some people are still sleeping, that's okay. But we got uh, a lot of falses, no falses. So let's see, is that the right answer? Yes, that's false. Um, so we don't want to, the, the, so basically agreed prices could be as simple as a contractor letter agreeing to an average price or continuing the bid price. So we're gonna talk more about that on the third week. Um, the basic premise here, the, the teaching point, the takeaway point is uh, don't, don't just default to the worst case scenario on every change order that's gonna be this mountain of paperwork and be insurmountable to figure out uh, many change orders are, are relatively simple, okay? So let's look at the next one. And go ahead and once you read it, you can start putting in what you think, true or false. All change orders go through a lengthy review process with multiple approvers, including the Office of the State Comptroller. True or false? Okay, so this one, we've got a little bit. We've got some trues and some falses. Looks like falses, falses are probably leading the pack, but I'd say it's about two thirds for false, a third for true. Okay, so this one's a little bit of a trick question. We're gonna talk about it. It's false because there are a couple change order types that don't go to the state comptroller, which um, we'll talk about those field change payments and administrative time extensions. We're gonna actually address the reason why those don't today. But again, that means that they only stay within your region, which means the approval process is much simpler and much quicker. Okay, so that's the takeaway point, is that when you can use a field change payment to make a contract payment, a contract change, um, you can do it in a matter of days instead of weeks. Okay, that's the takeaway point there. Okay, here's the last one. Every project change or adjustment requires a change order. True or false?
It looks like Trues are kind of leading the way here. I'd say Trues are about two-thirds, maybe even three-quarters to faults. A little bit of a trick again. It's faults. Um, and I'll qualify this, but we'll read the statement first. Adjusting existing units of work that are consistent with the limits and scope of a project does not require a change order. Additionally, minor alterations in the location of an item does not require a change order. So the example here would be like adjusting the invert on a pipe run to um, avoid a water service or a sewer lateral or something like that. So to just adjust that invert wouldn't require a change order. Um, let's say we're putting a sidewalk to someone's home or in a village situation and design only indicated one slab to be fixed, but when we check the grades, we really need to do about 20 feet instead of five, and we add that 15 feet. Um, that's consistent with the scope of the project and the limits. And now on the flip side of that, payment for that work may require a change order. So that's why it's a little tricky. Um, so if you said true, you were probably thinking of the payment side of it. So you may have to pay for something, but to actually get approval to do it, if it's consistent with scope, these minor things uh, do not require a change order. Okay, so this is where we kind of roll into we have the contract change order. We talked about what that is. Um, that was the strict definition. But then site manager, we all love site manager, right? We wouldn't be here if we didn't love site manager. And um, you can tell John King how much you love site manager. He's the guy to blame it all on um, if you have any suggestions. Um, however, site manager itself ha has the change order tab. So if we're familiar with site manager, there's the change order box there. Um, if we have the rights to have seen that. Um, if you haven't, there's a change order box. And every all of these types show up within that. That doesn't mean that that's the definition of a contract change order. So the first one is the field change payment. That's something we're gonna talk about next week. However, it's not a, an actual contract change order. A field change payment doesn't change the terms of the contract. It's actually a pre-assigned contingency item. Now it has special rules for its use. And we're gonna talk about those uh, next week. Um, but there's approximately 6% of the value of a contract is already pre-associated for overruns in the field change payment item. So that stays within your region. The regional construction engineer has the authority as the last person in the line to approve that. So that's why if you use a field change payment, you could get uh, a change order or take care of some item overruns uh, within a few days instead of many weeks. Uh, time extensions. So an actual extension of time based on a request from a contractor, they submit a form, a CONR 250, they still have work to do, they need another month or two of time, that is a standard change order. Uh, most definitely, it's changing a contract provision, which is the contract end date. However, we also have, and we'll talk about these in week seven, an administrative time extension. This just creates some more dates within the contract so we can uh, continue to run estimates yeah, you may or may not be aware, you can only run one estimate per day in Site Manager. So if you ran an estimate on the last day of the contract, you still are probably gonna have to run a couple more estimates to do cl for cleanup change orders. And then there's always a final estimate as well. So you may need to add some time to the contract for administrative purposes. This is under the Site Manager change order heading, but it's not an actual contract change order. It's just administrative, um, and it doesn't change the terms of the contract with the contract or. And then the last category in site managers change orders. This is pretty much everything else. So this is new work, quantity changes, funding changes, contract changes, field change payments, VECPs. That's it's just kind of a catch all. That's everything else. And if you want more information about these specifically, look at the CAM 10402. So you're gonna see that we have multiple uh, resources that we're pulling from as we work with our change orders. We've already talked about the standard specs. Now we're talking about the CAM. When you get into Site Manager, you're going to have QRGs. Um, I do, do see a question here. If we have to do estimates after the completion date, uh, do we need to change the dates? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's a little bit uh, into our office engineer training. We'll just dabble in it quick. So if you finish the contract, let's say, let's use January, let's use last month as an example. So it was January 31st. Uh, let's say your last day of work was Friday the 29th um, and you run an estimate 
encompassing all of that work? Because you wrote a DWR that day, you paid for something, you have to write an estimate that includes that date. That would only leave you two more days, two more estimates to be able to uh, complete the job. So you'd take up one of those with a cleanup change order and then main office needs one of those. Um, I'm going to defer to the group a little bit, but that's probably not enough time. You need to have about seven or ten days left when you're done with work from the last day that you did work to uh, complete the contract. Um, so if you had your last day of work was January 15th, but your completion date was January 31st, you could run an estimate on the 15th and you'd still have 15 more days to to run an estimate. Um, agree with that, uh, Amy and Eli? Uh, yes, yes, but there is uh, something I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, typically, um, I, once the field office is done processing estimates, it still has to go through a, a, a regional final. And um, that takes, uh, we try to give our, our regional office about five days to handle their back and forth in a, in a zero dollar final estimate. Yeah, good, thanks. So you, you need some days, you need to leave some days there. I think in general, you, you'd wanna leave 10 to 15 days, um, you know, is enough time to do that. And the more complicated the project, probably the more days you want because orders will come in and you want to pay them and they'll burn up a day. So, um, you know, that's that's just something you want to do. So hopefully we answered that question. Um, another question, even after using the FCP item to pay for overruns, sorry, um, doesn't there have to be an official order on contract for reconciliation purposes? Uh, Eli, that's a no, correct? Uh, that is a no. I'm not seeing the questions either. Oh, they're coming to me privately. I see. Okay. Yes. Um, if we could ask the attendees that when you enter a question into the chat, please make sure that you send it to everyone so that all the panelists can see it. <clears throat> yeah. So, mm -hmm. no, there is no official order on contract reconciliation purpose. The only thing that that you may have to do is if you don't use all of your FCP item every last cent, you may have to include that in a cleanup change order, um, you know, to bring bring the amount, you know, proper or whatever. Um, but no, there's no reconciliation at the end. Okay, uh, I got two more here. Um, my contract finished on December 31st, and I have one more estimate to run that will have the cleanup order on it. So um, should I be asking for an administrative um, administrative change order? So um, it depends when your last estimate was run. If you ran your last estimate on December 31st or December 30th, and you only have one day left, yes, you're going to be needing an administrative time extension because again after outside the field office um, you're going to have to uh, be able to do that. Um, you're going to have to have other days available uh, for others to do do their work. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, let's go to the next. So when uh, when is a change order needed? So this kind of goes on to the next step um, about um, when when do we do this? So we see we have these different items, but when do we actually have to take action? I guess that's the question here. Um, so the first one is extra work and new items of work. This is probably, you know, this one and time extensions are easy to identify. So if, if we have extra work, you know, there's been a discussion with the EIC, with the contractor, oh, we're going to do more of this. Uh, maybe we've extended a paving limit to meet uh, previous paving limit, you know, plans didn't show it clearly, or we've extended sidewalk a little bit to meet a previous limit, um, or we've adjusted something, or we, we're going to do something differently. Um, the first thing I want to remember, the extra work must be within the scope and limits of the original contract. Um, so John talked about that. Where do we find that? You know, we could go back to design. We could look at the design report. Um, however, um, just to get a good feel for for what we what we're doing on the contract, 
look at the contract description, look at the pay items, look at the special notes, and also the geographic limits. So here's an example. It's a pretty simplistic example. This probably is not, you know, real world like something you'd actually be faced with, but it kind of shows how you can separate these things. It says a pavement marking contract contains striping work throughout several identified counties in the region. A change order can be, can add additional work in any of the identified counties, but it cannot add striping work to different counties, or it couldn't do something out of scope like pavement repairs in, a, in any county. So we have to, the work has to be consistent with what's in the contract. Um, and generally, you know, we would lean on the construction supervisor area construction supervisor to kind of, um, you know, help us in that way if there was some questions. Um, but a lot of times, you know, the cover sheet, the proposal, um, that kind of nails us down to where, what our geography is. And then, um, you know, the limits and it's got to be similar uh, type work. Okay, so that's, so that we identify this extra work or new items of work. We know what we're adding. We're directing the contractor in a letter or an email to do this work, so we know there's extra work. Um, I guess it's the next one is existing item or underruns or overruns. So sometimes we know we're going to go over. Um, maybe we've looked at uh, different things as we go. We just know we're going to go over. Sometimes we don't know. We're not really aware, but there's we're going to show you there's a report that can help us to see um, through business intelligence that we've gone over an item. Um, or that we're approaching an item. And then the last is time extension. So obviously a time extension, we kind of understand, you know, what's going on. Um, hopefully we know our contract completion date, we know we're getting up, up on it, and we know we'll need to direct the contractor to extend or not, uh, or bring that up. So time extensions are pretty critical change order, but they're very specific. So we'll talk more about those in our last uh, last session. So item overruns are the biggest one we want to kind of take away here um, because they tend to sneak up on us for for multitude of reasons. So say you're on a big job, you know, multi-million dollar village job or something, you may be doing small amounts of certain items every day. And so it's just kind of a cumulative thing. Or perhaps you're doing, you know, a single element type job. So you're doing striping every day on these six items or whatever like that. Um, and they might be in multiple fiscal shares. So it may just sneak up on you that you have an overrun and it's not something you projected or you knew. So um, for item overruns, the, there's the two ways we're going to find that. The EAC may identify that through field staff, maybe doing yield checks on blacktop, maybe at a paving job, you got 20 days of paving and every day you're just running a little heavy on yield uh, or every day you know, you've noticed that it's wider than design, you know, estimated or something like that. So you know you're going to run over. Um, you just you just kind of know that. Or, you know, another good example would be you're doing, uh, you know, concrete repairs on a bridge or something, and you've gone ahead and when you sounded the concrete, you know, the areas are much bigger than estimated, and you know you're going to have an overrun. Okay, so those are some ones that stand out to you. You know you're going to have them. But sometimes they just they just creep up on you. You know, you find these little things in the contract as they come up. Um, and the the easiest way to do that is to use um, what we call the status A or AB report in business intelligence. So we're going to show you a little bit of that. But you're going to see this red box pop up three times about running an estimate before you use these. And Eli is just going to explain what we mean by dummy estimate. Um, so a, a, a dummy estimate is, uh, you know, you have all your payments in, all the DWRs are locked, uh, you think you're squared away, you're, you're going to quickly generate. And the, the reason for doing that is a, 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 a good portion of the reports in business intelligence are only going to give you a accurate information immediately after you generate. Um, so if it's been like two weeks, a month since your last estimate, you're not pulling current information. Uh, there, there are reports that are live and continuously update, but they're few and far between. Yeah, so we just need to understand that before we go ahead and show you this report. And a dummy estimate is uh, you, you just create an estimate in Site Manager and you might have to wait a minute or two for it to update in BI, and then you can delete that. So just create, just a little background, just creating an estimate doesn't mean you're paying. 
you still have to, someone has to approve it before it gets sent to Albany to pay. So as long as you don't do the approval process, you can create estimates as many as you want. You just need to go and delete delete them um, to create a new estimate. And the QRG is pretty, pretty specific on how you can do that. Um, so here's what the uh, Connor 22 status AB flagged report where you can find it. These are just some screenshots. We're not gonna go live with BI today. But if you get into your uh, business intelligence screen, um, this is the main screen for field office reports. So you log in, there's a main menu and you click field office and you pick your D, D contract. Um, and there's some good information there. It tells you how many days are remaining in the, in the contract, tells you what estimate you're on. But if you click on payments, then it opens this uh, menu here about payment reports and you can click on this um, AB flag report. Um, you can um, find this report there. And you can see there's some other helpful reports in here too, like a percent uh, consumption report. So that's another way you can kind of see if your items are sneaking up toward their contract quantity, you can keep track of it. Um, on a big job, you know, you may be very interested in that. On a smaller job, maybe it's, it's not as critical, um, but there's some reports here that we can use uh, to help us. And again, we just got the, the thing on there. Um, we we all uh, run a dummy estimate first, and you're gonna see on the next slide too. Um, so here's what the report actually looks like. So here's an example of the AB flag report. So what I did was I just highlighted all the ones that are a status A, and you can notice, like if we take the first one right off the top, it's a 203, uh, 03 embankment in place item, and its status A is for 186.54 cubic yards. Okay, so where did it come up with that? Well, if you look over here, it says our original contract quantity was 40. Um, then we've installed 226. So the status A is a simple uh, calculation of 226 minus 40, and you come up with 186.54. The, the other nice part of this report, you can see this office engineers on top of it, there's already a draft or a pending uh, change order for this amount and it shows you that right there, that there's right underneath that there's a, a pending change order for that amount. It just hasn't been uh, approved yet. And you could see these are all the status A's um, for this job. So this is a, a very important tool uh, whenever an estimate is run or in preparation for an estimate uh, to be looking at what your status A's are because obviously our one of the biggest parts of our job is to pay the contractor um, in a timely manner. Okay, so when we have several status A's, we need to be working toward resolving them um, as soon as we can. Anything else to add on this team? I just throw it out there. No, good. We do got one question about the quantity. Um, the quantity that's shown here is just going to be the difference between the um, between the contract quantity um, and what's been installed. Okay, so the I, I believe the person with the question is talking about thresholds. Uh, we haven't got to item renegotiation and thresholds yet. <clears throat> this is the first step where we just identify how much has gone over the contract quantity. Okay. Okay, so we've had we've got this report. We've got some overage um, in one way or the other. Um, in our case, we had the embankment, 186 yards. Um, before we go any further, we need to investigate and verify to make sure that the quantity is correct. Um, we're not saying there, that you've always got an incorrect thing there, but it's best to start from a place of assuming there's an error. Um, and there's some common things that happen out in the field. There could just be an inspector entry or a computation error. I think we've all done that before, right? We go to pay for five of something and we, we put 50 in instead because we're just, you know, site manager and we're, we're doing something and we put 50 instead of five. Well, if it's a small, you know, item uh, quantity wise that may put it way over, right? And it was just a, a miss, a data, a data mess. Um, there could be computation errors um, from time to time. Uh, some things are paid by the square yard instead of the square foot. 
uh, we probably all have an example where an inspector puts something in in the square foot, it should be paid by the square yard. So you're gonna be off by a factor of nine, correct? Um, we've probably had the TCI or somebody pay something by the cubic foot that should be paid by the cubic yard. You're gonna be off by a factor of 27. So just things like that, we wanna make sure, you know, we're on top of double payments for or payments for the same work. So um, we're all stretched pretty thin now, uh, field staff, things like that. So I know this has happened to me on village jobs before. Um, you have one inspector kind of running around, they're excavating for sidewalk, they're prepping it, and maybe they put the gravel down. Um, and then they go on to something else, uh, but they decided they're gonna pay for the gravel. Well, a week later, another inspector comes along and he's doing the sidewalk, but they gotta fine grade the sidewalk. And maybe he was uh, taught by his previous EIC that you pay for the gravel and the sidewalk together once it's fine graded and you place the concrete. So he pays for the gravel again. Um, so you can see no no one was necessarily wrong. It's just you're going to end up with two payments for the same work if you do it, do something like that. And uh, we've all been in the situation where inspectors are in and out. Some of these things are months apart. I've had it happen with conduit before for lighting or signals. Um, you know, as one school of thought, you pay for the conduit and the wire at the same time. Another school of thought is sticks in the ground, pay for it. Right, so there's just these things that can come up, that can creep up just because there's no hard and fast rule, there's no right or wrong way. We just have to pay attention that we're not double paying uh, for the same work. And then, you know, it, the quantity could be correct and there's just an engineer's estimate error. So we're going from the from the fact of we don't, we didn't know this was gonna be an overrun, what do we do? And we look at all these different things and make sure the entries are good, make sure there's no double payments. And we check the engineer's estimate for errors. And uh, some people call that the B file. Um, I guess maybe that's a little bit older school term, but the engineer's estimate or the B file. So the question is, where do we get that? So I'm, I'm giving you the backdoor way to get it because the contractors even should have it. So if you go to our website, the public website under bid and letting information, uh, then click on contract documents and you find your D number. And within there, not only do you see the proposal, the plans, there's also a CONR 9. And in this case, uh, this is from my region, they called it Supplemental 1. But within Supplemental 1 was the B file or the engineer's estimate information. And that contract document, it has uh, years worth of D, D pro, uh, project stuff on there. And there's also a, a P drive you can get at too. Um, however, um, maybe that's just, that's the backdoor way to get it. However, um, it should be transmitted to the engineer in charge at pre-con. So at the pre-con, um, it used to be handed across the table. Uh, now more likely it's in a handoff memo with a link. It should be stored in ProjectWise somewhere. So um, as a department employee, I'd first go to ProjectWise, see if I could find it. But there's another way to find it. And if all else fails, just reach out to the designer and say, hey, where's your B file? Or where's your engineer's estimate? Um, you're gonna see that there's some explanations in site manager that talk about design error. Um, they're stock, they're canned, but we have to verify that they actually did make a mistake with the engineer's estimate uh, before we can use that um, that that uh, explanation. Um, the last thing we wanna talk about today is the CONR 104, which is the authorization of extra work. You'll hear it as the AEW for short. Um, this is for any new or added work that does not have a prior approved change order or FCP, uh, such as future known work. Um, approval must be obtained before work is begun via the AEW. And this is laid out in our CAM uh, pretty, pretty uh, specifically, and it also is referenced in the 100 section that we should be obtaining this authorization for extra work. So um, this is kind of the the, the forerunner to actually building the change orders, getting this form accomplished and approved. And we're gonna show you uh, all the all the things about this. Um, basically all added quantities to existing items also need an approved AEW. And then if we're gonna be using the AEW for a field change payment, there's a couple other little things that we wanna keep in mind as well. All right, and then uh, Eli's gonna take over from here and walk you through the AEW. All right. 
the AEW, um, it, it has thresholds on it. Uh, less than 20,000 uh, only needs to be signed by the EIC. Uh, 20 to 50,000 is the EIC and the supervisor. Uh, greater than 50 is the supervisor and the RCE. Um, there's a little red note there in the lower left-hand corner. Um, you should also confer with your regional policies. Um, I can only speak for Region 2. Um, we have a regional policy that uh, all AEWs at a minimum should be signed by an EIC and a supervisor, um, regardless of the of the value. So if it is less than that twenty thousand, uh, you're still shipping it to your supervisor for his uh, approval, his or her approval. Um, get the next slide, Mike. So what we have here is an AEW. Um, Tenor 104, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the date. It's really tough to see that, but I think it says 2018. Uh, make sure you're working in the latest and greatest version of it. Uh, it can be found uh, on the external website uh, in the fillable forms. Uh, uh, region 2 also has a link to it on their inner dot page. Uh, I'm sure some other regions uh, have the, the, the same thing going. Uh, it's pretty intuitive, uh, top to bottom, left to right. Um, boxes 1 through 7 is, is basic information, region, D number, uh, county, date, uh, contract description, the engineering charge, uh, field office facts, that's kind of obsolete nowadays. Uh, if you have one, obviously put it in. And then the contractor. Um, where it gets a little trickier is boxes uh, 8 through 18. Uh, and where most people get hung up on is box 8. Um, and that is, is contract FHWA, RFA, or NCA. Um, just below, in the middle here, uh, we have uh, RFA and NCA um, boxes. Uh, within uh, Site Manager land, um, if you go to the main panel, uh, contract administration, contract records, and contracts, you can find uh, this box. Um, if uh, the federal oversight box is checked, RFA, you need uh, FHWA approval for your change orders, um, which adds another layer um, to them. Um, any questions about that? No? All right. Um, next, yep, there we go. Um, in the middle, um, that's the, uh, oh wait, circling back. Uh, boxes 10, 12, 14, 16, uh, 9, uh, piggybacks 8. Uh, if you do need, you know, RFA, uh, if you do have an RFA job, you do need FHWA concurrence, like I said. Uh, in my 19 years here, I've only seen one job uh, within our region. It was a very large dollar amount job uh, that had FHWA concurrence. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, much more common uh, uh, in the, the down by the city, the southern regions, 8, 10, 11. Um, you know, your larger dollar value projects. Um, 11, sufficient funding in place. Uh, Proposed work within the scope, yes or no? Uh, has the project manager been notified, yes or no? Uh, 16, your original bid amount, and 17 is your current contract amount, which can be found on your uh, latest and greatest CONR 22. Um, 
Box 18, since uh, this example is a field change payment, your, your estimated increase due to this change order is uh, a zero. Um, the body of the AEW, uh, the middle is the in description of the proposed extra work. Um, you list your items and uh you know the why uh of what you're doing and and you know what you encountered um in the 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 last sentence there in the description um you know clearly states that this is a field change payment uh 69703 will be used uh to address these uh item increases um Boxes 20 through 27 are your items, uh, the description of the item, the unit of measure, uh, your original contract quantity, the authorized quantity to date, added quantity, price type, and unit price. Um, the AEW is set up to uh, auto calculate and that can be found in the estimated AEW total uh, where the yellow arrow is. Um, I hinted on this earlier, um, box uh, number 28, um, there's uh, three little dots and uh, the left one is for less than 20, the middle one is 20 to 50 and the one to the right is greater than 50. Um, now, as you change across these, um, it will modify the bottom of the form to uh, encompass the required signatures. So, uh, as stated before, uh, 20 is the engineer in charge, 20 to 50 EIC and area supervisor, 50 construction supervisor and regional construction engineer. There is a second page to this as well if you need it. So the AEW is not limited to three items. Um, so you can go on to page two, but you could see if you only have one or two items, um, don't attach a blank page two to the to the change order or whatever. Get rid of that. Get rid of that sheet. But there's a whole another sheet, and it's only all it is is more room for items, and it will. Uh, adjust this total, the AEW total, the second page. It's all linked together. Uh, we do have quite a few questions, Mike. Yeah, let's let's clean them up. Um, yeah. First one I see is um, I think the one about cl close up, clean oh, up for man. close up. Is an AEW required for additional work added to the cleanup order during project closeout? Yes, uh, the, you're modifying the quantity. Anything you'd like to add to that, Mike? No. Nope. All right, uh, then we got uh, RFA concurrent recommended getting approval email from FHWA sent with AEW. Um, uh, you know, to, to be honest with you, I would have to defer to someone downstate about how they're getting a FHWA concurrence. Um, we're not that familiar with that in this region. Uh, I don't know, Amy, have you done one? No, personally, I have not, and I'm not sure if my regional change order specialist is on the call right now. Okay, well, that, maybe that's an that, maybe that's an answer we can get toward the end. So whoever asked that, if you want to hang out, we'll we'll try to we'll try to get an email out and get an answer for that. Um, starting. Um, oh, Eric, yeah, go ahead. We we had the uh, the prospect mountain phase one, phase two that it was RFA. We didn't require 
documented FHWA concurrence at the CONR 104 level. Anytime there were major changes, there were documented correspondence within the change order itself attached okay. to the header. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, uh, can we get these notes in PDF format? I guess they're asking for the PowerPoint. Uh, um, yeah, well, I think, John, we're going to get the PowerPoints and the videos. I'll made them, make them available probably, I don't know when, but at some point, right, John? Yeah, we'll find a good good spot to post everything. Um, P drive or maybe maybe on the website. We'll, we'll we'll find a good spot to post it and we'll let everybody know where it is. Yeah, and we'll get it we'll get it out. Just to point out, we have 291 currently on the call, and we don't really know who half of you are because we don't have your email address, your full name, or your region. So we will be dealing with the regional contacts only, and they will disperse it to each region. Yeah. Yep. I'll let each of the people know that I sent the invite to this for. So they sent it to you. Oh, so everybody on here. So they know who they sent it to, so they can let them know where we post stuff. Okay. The pro a question about the project manager. So I think that's box 15 on the AEW. That is not the EIC in the site manager sense. Um, that refers to the project manager probably in your uh, planning group that is kind of the funding guru. Um, so I would assume each region works a little differently about notifying the project manager. Um, I know in our region, if there's a large change order that's really going to move the needle money-wise, we would notify the project manager if it's a relatively small um, change or if it's an FCP, there's no dollar amount change coming, you know, it would be a no. So I think that's kind of up to regional, uh, you know, your regional procedure, whatever that would be. Uh, the next one is it, if it is a rec amended amount contract amount is the amended amount. So I think we're talking about this box up here. So the current contract amount would include uh, any previously approved change orders. So you have your as bid amount and then you have your current contract amount. It's anything that's been approved. So if you have change orders that are pending, th those will not be included on the AEW form until they're actually approved and the contract amount is adjusted. Yeah, and then just to, in this scenario, uh, 16 and 17 are identical. So it's safe to assume uh, no conventional order on contracts have been done and uh, just FCPs or nothing. Yep. yep. Um, Appia. So we don't use Appia for New York State. You're talking about a local project you would have to uh, find out from your local program bureau if you have a federal highway uh, approval process in Appia, but I will say that, uh, you know, a CONR 104 is a DOT document. It's not a local program document. So I feel like you're probably working outside of the DOT with that question, and a 104 probably doesn't, doesn't come up. Um, that would be between the sponsor and the engineering firm uh, doing the inspection and the contractor doing that. So this form probably really doesn't apply to that. Uh, could we attach an Excel file to Connor 104 for better explanation and description? That comes from Region 8, Amy. You want to answer that? I know how I would answer it, but it's a Region 8 question. Uh, that's funny. Um, you'd have to speak with our regional change order specialist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, when they when they're that large, which they sometimes are in Region Eight, if you need to attach additional information, feel free. Yeah, and and I would just piggyback on that a little bit. Don't overcomplicate this form. It's not meant to be the change order. We're going to go and talk about the change order explanations and descriptions. Um, so, like, if it saves you time because you don't have to retype it or something, but. 
I will say by and large, 95% of the AEWs I see do not require additional information at this stage. It's very general. It's meant to be quick. Um, you know, we don't need to go into lots of detail on here. And, and just so you understand, everyone that's in a field office, this is protecting you because you see the, the levels. Um, someone else is signing off that it's okay to do this work. So I know sometimes we get a little difficulty getting buy-in on AEWs. Just remember it protects you in the field that you have a piece of paper that shows, hey, somebody above me said I can do this work. Um, what kind of condition it puts them in down the line, that's, you don't have to worry about that, but um, it does, <laughs> you know, it does uh, kind of uh, get you off the hook, so to speak, that someone else has approved that work. Um, do we need an AEW for a where and when project if still within budget? Oh, what do you, Eli, where are you, where are you at with that? Uh, a where and when, no. It, yeah. it, it, as long as you still have quantity, one, once you break it, uh, then then yes. And uh, the fairly complicated change orders involved. Yeah. Okay. And we got a couple. Yeah. And I know where and when's are a little bit different animal. Usually, when you go ask for more funding, you're going to have to produce a site list, and possibly also you could be asked to provide authorization for those sites to replenish it. Um, you gotta, there's some rules with that that uh, we're not going to get into here, but you got to be careful with that. Um, just a couple comments about the FHWA rep. It sounds like maybe it's a little bit up to the rep of the project, and sometimes emails um, back and forth are all that is required, and we kind of, that's your authorization. Uh, question about box number 18 which is the dollar amount regarding overrun, underrun, change order. Um, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna underrun, you're gonna have a negative. I've seen negative numbers. If you're gonna overrun, you're gonna have a positive number there. Okay, uh, another question, another comment about uh, FHWA, it's only required on the change order, but advanced communication is always a good tool. So. It sounds like to me that's that's what this is at. We're not looking for some sign off necessarily, but it's a good reminder that if you have FHWA oversight, don't wait to the change order for that to be the first time that they're hearing about it. Let them know what's coming one way or the other. So it's kind of a nice little um, nice little thing there. What determines if sufficient funding is in place? This goes back to the project manager question. Um, so the project manager would be able to tell you if sufficient funding is in place. Again, um, if it's an FCP, you already have the money available. Sometimes we have, um, I know I've done this too, where we, we're removing some work and adding other work and the net positive isn't that much. Um, but that's more of a regional question to see at what point is something of sufficiently large size that it requires planning to be involved? That's that's that question. Um, a lot of times, I would say a lot of our changes aren't to that level. They're much smaller. Um, and then, you know, another thing to throw in everybody, you know, you got fuel and asphalt adjustments. Those are contractual. Um, they could be in here and there's really nobody to ask. That just has to be done. It's a contractual requirement. So. Um, you know, there's other times where it's not even worth asking the question because you have to do it. Um, so, Amy, you had one. Do you want to go ahead and elaborate? So, someone asked me personally the question, if you're using the same item number, but with a new line item number for a renegotiation, Yes, you have to put the A before the item description. On the AEW form, that's the only, I take that back, it's not the only differentiation between two items with the same item number, um, but it is one of the differentiation. If, so if you're increasing your original item to the threshold, you'll have your original item number, the description, and then all the way over on the right for the price type, you would have bid price. Then your next line should show the same item number again, this time with an A before the item description, and then your price type for that will be agreed price. 
I hope that answered that participant's question clearly. Yeah, I think so. That's good. Um, and he, again, um, just to reiterate, you know, this looks more complicated than it is, and we're spending a lot of time on it, understand. Um, but uh, generally, um, these could be completed in pretty short order. Um, and I think the last thing, maybe we didn't touch on, Eli, is where does it go? Where does it go when we've, we've done what we need to do in the field office? Oh, good point. Um, and we send it to the uh, RCO uh, for your region for review, and then they will pass it on to the uh, the uh, whomever has to sign it. Perfect. So yeah, send it to your change order person. They'll route it and get it get it back to you for inclusion, and then they keep a copy, and and there you go. So okay, very good. I think that's all we had about AEWs. That was kind of the end. Um, we will have a little for Q&A, but let's just do some review questions. Um, unfortunately, don't have 300 prizes to hand out, but let's see. Change orders are needed too. Um, go ahead and you can, can type in the chat box if you want to answer the question. Uh, they're needed to address item overruns, to add field change sheets, to settle contract disputes or D all of the above? Lots of Ds, 1A, I think they're pulling my, pulling my leg there. Let's see what the, uh, let's see what the answer is, all of the above. Okay, that one's pretty easy, you know, no real tricks there. We, we kind of went back in the beginning and all these things are, are required. Uh, require a change order. <clears throat> How about another one? Item overruns are easily found in Site Manager, EBO, Business Intelligence, or the B file. What does everybody think? Okay, so we're going to find anybody that put EBO, and we're going to go and fix that today. But most everyone else had C, which is business intelligence. So I'm just going to assume somebody pressed B instead of C. Business intelligence. So, um, oh, in advance of business intelligence. Just a just a note on that, everybody. We're not really going to get into too much business intelligence here. We're going to show you a couple of the the reports and things like that. That is really something you want to you want to get familiar with. Um, to get into business intelligence, start looking at those reports, looking at the different D jobs and the, all the things you can get a lot of data. So if you just, what I try to, to tell everybody is site manager is data in, business intelligence is data out. Um, you can get some things out of site manager. It's generally difficult to extract data right from site manager. Um, but by and large business intelligence, you don't put anything into it, you just get you get stuff out of it. Um, so that's kind of the, that would kind of be uh, a good thing to learn and to get to get a good grasp of where some of these things are. And there is an actual, if you sign into business intelligence, there's a nice crosswalk, a document there that shows you where all these different reports are found under the different menus, because there's multiple menus and things like that. We're gonna touch on it as we go through um, the training here, but that's a good thing to kind of look at on your own. Last question, <clears throat> AEWs are needed if A, new work is planned, B, a time extension is requested, C, material samples are created, or D, existing items fail to hit contract quantity. Yeah, perfect. I think everybody got it. A, new work is planned. So the other things don't require AEWs, right? That's funny. Somebody put faults. <laughs> I got to laugh. It's been talking for an hour, so I got to laugh. Uh, that's, that's funny. Uh, but uh, so just a couple review questions here. Um, at this point, I think there was one other question there. If I can just go up to it. We'll be happy to kind of hang out and answer questions. At that at this point the formal presentation's done. I want to thank everybody for being here. I encourage everybody to get here next week at 930. Seems like it went pretty smooth. I think Amy did a great job getting this all set up and hopefully me and Eli did okay navigating and answering your questions. 
So question uh, is, who initiates the change order for field change sheets, designer or the field office? Um, so that's one of the questions. There's a two part. So uh, generally, well, initiating the change order, only construction can put forward a change order. So we would have to write the change order. But who would actually initiate the change and the need for a field change sheet? That's kind of up to what the whatever the issue is. So some things are relatively simplistic, and we can pick them up in record plans, and design can give us you know direction easily. But sometimes it's a structures issue. Uh, I know I'm dealing with one right now where we uh, we had to add reinforcing strands to beams, and that triggered uh, some field change sheets and design just generated them automatically and provided them to us. So it wasn't really, a, there wasn't really any, any uh, you know, debate. If you have a question, ask, ask your construction supervisor at what point um, you would require a field change sheet. Um, and then if existing items are used in the change, is a CO still required? So what's really good to do is <clears throat> if you're gonna put forward the change sheet and there's some adjustment to the contract because of new items or uh, and I think this is what you're getting at, or if there's going to be an increase in quantities of certain items, um, then you know you want to um, you want to try to include those in that order because you're pointing to why you're going to have those changes because you've got these sheets that have been issued, um, and those seem to go go through quickly. You can add other items later. It's not that you can't, um, but then you'll be referring to field change sheets and previous orders. So um, I know with the one we have right now um, that I'm dealing with, we don't really know what the cost implication is. We've had some reinforcing and some beam design. We haven't got word if there even is a cost change or not. So we're waiting for that information. But yeah, you'd like to kind of roll everything all into one, whatever you know that the change is, is going to cost. So hopefully that answered your question. Uh, a comment here, yeah, field change sheets and field revision sheets are always kind of a question. Field revision sheets are what we do in the field office at the end of the job. Field change sheets uh, are generated by design and and generally generally by design and sent back through um, to construction. And why, your sup why the supervisor is gonna be really uh, worried about that is because if design doesn't provide a field change and there's a change, then the supervisor has to stamp the sheet and be responsible for the change. So that's part of the liability slash who, who really made the change goes back to who's supposed to supply the information. Any other questions? Go ahead and type them out if you've got any other questions. All right. Well, I think that's gonna that's gonna do it. We still got 270 on. Uh, anybody else on the panel have anything to to add today? No, Mike. I think you and Eli did an awesome job, and thanks Andy for uh, <clears throat> setting this all up. The only thing quick while people are still on is next next Tuesday. If you could get here and get and join on, you know, 925 or so, just because the beeps of the calls coming in are real distracting. So if everybody could, you know, get on as opposed to like cause we had people joining all the way up to like 10 o'clock. So just get here on time. That way to get, get the beeps over with the people joining in before we get cranking, that'd be great. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. It's hard without looking at a crowd. I guess I guess we're good to go. No more questions came in. Yeah. Yeah, you guys did a great job. We'll uh, see you next Tuesday. Take care. Bye, everybody. how I can get out of here. No, <laughs> I'm doing the same thing as an epileptic kid over here. Because I just... <laughs> There's no way to turn that off.
Isn't that a beat note for people? I'm just going to mute for a second. 